showtime. He lost family. He actually lost family in that fire. Family that he loved as near and dear as you all loved your family. I plan to give you a vastly different story than the prosecution might wish you to believe. We've had more than our fair share of talented and incredibly versatile guests on our show. And tonight, we get to add another guest to that list. You know him as Ralph Mouth on the hit TV series, Happy Days, but our guest tonight is so much more. He's an accomplished singer, director, and of course, actor. Please welcome to the Rosie and Bill show, Don Most. Don, welcome to the show. Uh, thank you, Rosie and, and Bill. Great to be with you, and thanks for having me. It's our pleasure, as always. And uh, we're just gonna jump right into kind of where you are now. I know you're doing a, a lot of on-screen work, you're doing in the studio work. So what? tell us about this latest film you just released last month, Lost Heart. I'm really excited about this movie. It was, um, I shot this about a, almost a year ago in Western Michigan with a wonderful production company called Collective Development, my second film with them. I did one called Man's Best Friend, um, which is on Amazon Prime right now. And uh, I had such a good experience that uh, when they asked me to do a second one, I, I jumped. And uh, it's, it's, just, it's a comedy drama, a lot of heart and a um, little bit of mystery to it. Um, I think people really enjoy it. It's, uh, I, I play a small town pastor, so it's a very different role from what people, uh, if they only know me from Happy Days, would, would, they would see a big difference. Um, and that's what I enjoy, playing a lot of different kinds of roles. And uh, it's gonna be released on Courage TV for the world premiere. So you can go to their website and subscribe for free. But I'm really excited and I uh, hope people tune in for it. It's a really, I saw the movie, it's a really beautiful film. Well, we're excited to see it. Sounds like you got to flex some of your acting muscles. Yeah, it was a very, um, the one I did l last year, uh, Man's Best Friend was a, I play a defense attorney uh, defending a wounded vet. It was a pretty heavy film. And, you know, I got some strong scenes um, and um, it was great. This one was a different challenge because I'm coming from a very, you know, not an aggressive sort of uh, vibe so where an, a, lo a lawyer might be. You know, he's, he's um, somebody who's really trying to help the lead character in this movie and he's trying to find his way in to help her. And so there's a lot of patience and understanding and unconditional love, so to speak. So um, quite different. Who's to say how God reveals himself? What? With lights in the sky? She repents, will God forgive her? Well, of course. He's forgiven worse than that, right? Pops must be very happy in heaven. Yeah, why is that? Because you came back. Check it out, people should check it out and see what they think. Well, and Don, I have to tell you, I've seen the trailer for it, and I know you just mentioned a moment ago that this is the second time you're working with this group. And truth be told, just last night, I watched Man's Best Friend on Amazon. Oh, oh wow. And oh. I, I was so blown away by, by everyone and everything in that movie. Um, I just, and you were fantastic, like you said, playing, playing that attorney. Oh, and thank you. I, I noticed some of the same landing, folks are in guilty. Lost Heart. Yes. Um, yes. And just, I think anyone, especially if you're a dog lover. Um, <laughs> yeah. It, it yeah. was, oof. 
I got to say, it's pretty moved. Yeah, it gets pretty powerful, that film. And uh, not, not too many dry eyes in the crowd when I went to see, you know, this uh, premiere uh, at a theater. Um, people really, you know, responded to it. It's very emotional. And um, yeah, it's surprising. Surprising film. And yeah, like you said, um, same people, because they, they, it's a great group. It's called Collective Development. And it's a group of people that formed this company and they, they do all their films together. They'll bring in other people, but it's almost like a repertory company of their actors. And they'll, one film, this one will get a big part, a bigger part, and the others will have supporting roles. The next film, the, the other one will have a bigger, but it's really, uh, you know, like a repertory company and on film and talented people behind the camera. So um, I, I hope to do a lot more with them. I was just really excited to, to, to be part of their family. And uh, I'm glad you got to see Man's Best Friend um, before this interview. So you have a bit of a taste oh, of, yeah. of what yeah, that well, was all about. Yeah, and you know, you and Rosie had just talked about a couple minutes ago, you know, just doing these things, you know, outside of or kind of a departure from what people might be used to seeing you as. And I just was, like I said, the entire cast, but I thought the role that you played was fantastic. And you're right oh, about that. You. I'm not going to give anything away, but the dry eyes. I mean, and I'm a big fan of action movies. I don't venture out of that genre very often. Oh, really? But I'm glad I did last night. Oh, good. It was, good. It was definitely <laughs> worth it. Yeah, for sure. Oh, great. Great. And, Thank you but, very much. Sure. And, and another piece that I wanted to, to bring up and talk about a little bit, which I also happened to see recently, is... What you did with uh, your former co-star from Happy Days, Anson Williams, Harvest right. Time. Yes. That was another yes. different role for you. And yeah. talk to us a little bit about that, because that was a powerful, powerful 25 or 30 minutes, whatever it was. It was fantastic. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I, I love that, that project. Um, a, a producer came to Anson and I, it was a couple of years ago, with an idea to do a, an anthology series where you'd bring two well-known actors together that you know from a certain show, whether it be a sitcom or a drama, and, and they have great chemistry together. And his, his vision was, I bet you that chemistry is gonna continue even if you put them in something very different. And it'll be fun to see them in something completely different. And he wanted us to do the pilot. And, uh, we, we, and there was a wonderful playwright that he knows in New York, Fred Stropple, that had all these great one-act plays. So they're just, but for the most part, two actors in one location for like 20, 35, 30 minutes go straight, you know, no, in real time, you're just staying with them. And, um, and we picked one of the scripts, they were all good. And, and, and it was very different because uh, we, we play brothers, Anson and I, but his character, he's on dialysis machine at home. He'll, he'll die if he doesn't get a kidney. And then I'm his brother, and I, Matt, I, I promised him my, my, you know, my kidney, uh, one of my kidneys. <laughs> and, um, and, uh, and then there's a big curveball that, you know, people, I'm not going to say, <laughs> but, but it's kind of like a David Mamet meets Neil Simon kind of play. It's dark comedy, and it gets a little dramatic. And, um, and it was a great acting exercise for the two of us. Like you said, for 25, 30 minutes, I mean, it's nonstop, and it's mm -hmm this back and forth and the dynamics shift and um, it was really well written and it was a great vehicle for, for acting. And um, uh, it was a blast. People should check that out too. I wanted to switch gears just a little bit. We've been talking about your on-screen work and I want to take us in the studio where sure. you were working on a new CD uh, with music producer, Tony Manter, who's also not just a great music producer. He's a great friend of the show. And oh. We understand that you were two thirds ish through the CD when the pandemic hit, and that this was maybe a little different than some of your prior work musically. So, can you tell yeah. us about the new CD and what's different about it? Sure. Um, yeah. Well, I, I came. I have a CD that came out about two years ago because I I used I started out singing. That was my my sort of my first love and and main focus when I was young, 14, 13, 14, going to a school in Manhattan for singing and acting and dancing. And then I got picked to be part of this troupe, a review 
that performed up in the Catskill Mountains one summer when I was 15 and singing. I loved all the old the great standards and American songbook and jazz and all that. Um, so I, I put, after that summer, I put it aside and switched gears into acting, but I always knew I'd want to come back to the music at some point because I've always, I continue to love that genre. And um, so about five years ago, I said, if I'm ever going to do it, this is the time that kind of music is popular again. Not like in, back in the 70s when I was on Happy Days, it was, it was looked upon as my parents and grandparents' music. But, you know, there's been a resurgence of, of the standards and, the, and all the, uh, the great American songbooks, so to speak. And um, so I, I put together an act started playing clubs in New York and LA jazz clubs and some theaters. And then I, uh, one thing led to another and I was do, wound up doing a CD in, in LA with a great producer, a uh, musician named Willie Murillo. And uh, we put out a CD called uh, Mostly Swinging, D Most, Mostly Swinging, with a great big band, 17 piece band and, and you know, great arrangements and st it swings. Uh, the musicians are in, in, in insanely talented. And, Nothing um, like a big band. Oh man, I always loved that. That um, it's it's a, an incredible high to me, and um, especially when you when they're behind you and you're, you know, they're just it's like a wave. You just feel it. So um, I, I had a great great experience, and and I'm very proud of the CD. And people could check it out on Amazon or iTunes. Um, but then I, I met Tony Mantor, as you mentioned, um, through a mutual friend, and and he he listened to my stuff and saw some of my videos, and and he said, Man, I'd love to, we should do something. And but I, I see, let's I see it in a different vein. Let's do it in a more contemporary jazz setting, not the big band, and maybe even throw in some other kinds of. He had this idea, and we we wound up doing. Some, some jazz standards, but in a much more contemporary jazz setting. And then mixing in some cool songs from the 60s and 70s that, that we did in a style and it sort of fit, but like, a, like we did um, Ain't No Sunshine, you know, the Bill Withers tune, it was before he passed away. And, and then we did um, we, The Look of Love, which was, that was a jazz standard. But then a couple of other ones, which I won't mention, that was um, a Smokey Robinson R&B song, which it came out great. Uh, a Smokey Robinson R&B thing, which I never would have thought of doing, but um, it, it, it really came out great. And then a few others that I won't mention, I don't want to give away um, from 60s and 70s. So it's an interesting sort of mix, you know, a little bit, um, a little different. And, but yet, because of the, because of Tony's producing and, and the musicians, which are the common thread in the arrangements, they all sort of, you know, somehow fit in, in this, in the CD. So um, I'm just, it was frustrating because it, it was co going so well. Um, I was really happy with the way uh, it was sounding. And then we had four songs left and then the pandemic hit and we had to stop, you know, cause we couldn't get, in the studio, put the musicians together and all that. So um, I've been chomping at the bit to get back to Nashville where Tony is and get in the studio and, and finish it up so we can get it out. So probably the spring is what we're aiming for. Well, we all hope that that, that is the case and that things are able to really start flowing again. Yeah, for a want. lot of people. For a yeah, lot of people. So we can all really get back to work. Uh, we're going to take our quick break right now and talk more with Don, including about a very cool TV show that he was a part of back in the day. But right <laughs> now it's time for 60 Seconds with Coach Lombardi. Take it away, Coach. Thanks, Rosie and Bill. Great show today, by the way. I want to hurry up with this tip so I can get back to Don Most. So today I want to speak to all of you amazing men who are watching the show. Here are a few key fitness tips you need to know. Number one, 
you've got to stretch. You might not think it's important, but it's vital for staying injury free and helping your muscles move more freely and in a full range of motion. Number two, please slow down. I often see men in the gym not only going through their entire workout fast, but going through each exercise way too fast. This not only does nothing good for you, but in some cases can be the cause of injury. So when you're doing a general weight training program, take about 10 full seconds to lift and lower the weight. Slowing down will give you a much better muscle response and help prevent injury. And number three, don't be afraid to take a break. Take a day off or do something different. I see a lot of the same guys in the gym day after day after day training the same body parts. This can cause overtraining and overuse. I like for my clients to take a break and do an active recovery, like hiking, surfing, or cycling. Well, I hope that helped. I'm Coach Lombardi and back to you guys. Thank you so much coach we love your tips and i always look forward to implementing them and some of them go better than others so <laughs> so <laughs> don before the break you know we were talking about everything you've been doing now but obviously it's been quite a journey for you and a lot of people saw you on happy days and thought you were like this overnight sensation but that really couldn't be further from the truth because the truth is, as you mentioned earlier, you started your career at the age of 13. What was that journey like from a boy with dreams to scoring a hit TV series in Hollywood? And what did you need to get you to that success? Oh, good, good question. Um, yeah, 13 is when I started sort of going after it. Um, when I was nine, I, I saw a movie, The Jolson Story, and that really lit the, the major fire under me. It was a biopic about the great Al Jolson. And, um, but, and, but I was kind of too ashamed, I think, to admit that I wanted to pursue something like that. Um, but by the time I was 13, my parents knew, and, and they helped me find a school in Manhattan, and I would go on weekends. Uh, I was about 13, yeah. And I'd take the subway from Brooklyn into Manhattan and go on Saturdays. And, um, and then through that school, uh, I got picked. Uh, the guy who ran it also would handpick the, the, the top people from, from that studio. And then he would form an act, like a review, a nightclub review. And there were seven or eight of us, age 14 to 16. And... Um, and then I got picked to be part of it. So I spent uh, the summer when I was turning 15, performing in the Catskill Mountains in, in this nightclub review singing. And uh, it was a great, great experience. And, um, you know, I was just so, you know, I, I knew that this is what I wanted to do and acting and singing. And then I switched gears kind of at my father's suggestion to to enroll in a more serious acting class because he had seen some of the stuff I'd been I I'd done in plays, whether it be at school or somewhere, and um, I, I think he knew that this particular that nightclub thing and that wasn't going to go. Uh, it wasn't the right mix for me. Um, not that it was not, nothing to do with the singing, but just that particular dynamic. So I, I did go to. Uh, a really good acting class, a workshop, and and I loved it. And you know, we were doing scenes from all different plays. It was mainly theater that we were that that was the training more in the theater world. And but then I got uh, through that. I met a woman who became my manager, and she got me out to meet a lot of agents in New York. And I was running around and starting to go on all those auditions, and and you know, going into uh, Manhattan first from Brooklyn and for all the a lot of auditions and then started doing commercials in New York which was big there and then I was going to college at, at Lehigh in Pennsylvania and um, I would be taking the bus for three hours in for an audition and then get on you know a subway and then it's crazy for like a 10 minute audition and then go back to school <laughs> yeah. and I, I I wasn't in class a lot as a result, but I knew 
that when you said, what does it take? Um, when I look back, it was just that I was just so laser focused on what I wanted to do. And, you know, it was just going after it with, with that single minded purpose and, and uh, tunnel vision, so to speak. And I think that's a, a important thing to have. Um, if you're gonna, it's a tough business. It's a very competitive and crazy, unfair at times, cool business. But um, yeah, when people ask me how, what I would recommend to them, I'd say you just have to want this more than anything. You, you can't think of anything else you wanna do and that's it. Otherwise it's, it's too difficult a business. It's not always fair and it's competitive and, and you have to have that kind of commitment and focus. Um, I think, you know, I mean, there are people that fall into things and, and there are those stories, but I think most of the people that you see up there that are doing it at a high level have had that kind of single minded uh, drive to, and, and vision. I think that's great advice, Don. And, you know, you just talked about how difficult it is and about the competition. So there's, there's a question I have for you because our understanding is that at one time, you and Anson Williams were both competing for the same role as mm. Potsy Weber, and yet you still ended up on the show. How'd that happen? <laughs> yeah, good. Another good question. Uh, yeah, I was... So I went out to California after my junior year in college um, to make some contacts and see what would happen out there uh, for, for when I graduated a year later. Um, uh, I, I wound up getting a few you know, auditions and landing a few guest starring roles pretty quickly. One thing led to another and decided not to go back for my senior year, take six months off and c keep the momentum going. And then you know, I got another part in something and then nothing. And I thought, oh no, this is bad, bad idea. But then Happy Days, the Happy Days audition came up and, and it was for the role of Potsy, as you mentioned. That's who I was. I, I met with the producers several times. And then for Gary Marshall, the executive producer and creator of Happy Days, I had to read for him and, and about 10 other people in a room. And, and then they asked me to screen test. And the day of the screen test, there were, you know, there were about seven different actors reading for Potsy and seven for Richie. And um, Anson Williams was was one of them reading for Potsy along with Ron Howard for Richie. And they had actually done the pilot, a former pilot of Happy Days two years before, and it didn't sell. And then after Graffiti came out, American Graffiti in Greece on Broadway, ABC said, oh, wait a minute, uh, maybe we should re you know, take another look, revisit that show that Gary had. But, but they made Gary see other actors because they thought Anson would be too old and Ron would be too old two years later. So they had to audition again, even though they had shot the pilot two years earlier. So, so I saw Ron and Anson and I knew that they kind of were the front runners, you know? So it was a little intimidating. But he was auditioning again for Potsy, and I, as I was. So then, uh, a few days later, my agent called and said, "You know, you didn't get the role. You didn't get that role. They're going with Anson again, but they liked your screen test so much that they want to make you a regular in the show. And there's a small part in the pilot, and they said they could expand that, and you know, and you'd be in most. You know, they guarantee me." 10 out of 13 episodes and, and, and I would be in the show as in a different role. So that's how that came about. Kind of a interesting turn of events, so to speak. That's incredible. I mean, what's it like to get that kind of news? You, you know, they want you to be a series regular. Yeah. Well, you know what happened? I was up at the same time for another part in a TV movie, very dramatic, which I was more interested in doing. And it was written by the guy, Herman Rauker, who had, writ who had written a movie called The Summer of 42, which at the time I loved, it was a great film. And it was gonna be directed by Buzz Kulik, who directed Brian's Song, the original Brian's Song, which was the, the most successful TV movie of, the t of that time. So, and there was another uh, period piece, World War II. I wanted, and I had a really good chance of getting that part. So when they called me up 
on Friday, Friday, my agent called me on Friday night and said, told me what happened. We turned it down. We, I, we decided not, I said, let's pat, you know, I'd rather do the other, other thing. And he agreed. My agent said, yeah, let's, let's go for the uh, TV movie. So we turned it down. But it just so happened that my agent played basketball every Saturday at Gary Marshall's house. So when he was there the next day, Gary pulled him aside and said, you know, what's with your boy turning us down? And, and, he, and Gary said, I think this is going to happen. It's going to go on as a midseason replacement. And um, instead of seven out of 13 episodes, we can guarantee Donnie at the time, we can guarantee him 10 out of 13 and we'll raise his salary, you know, made a better offer mon money wise. And then my agent came back on Monday, called me and said, we might want to reconsider this. <laughs> and so then we found, so cra it's crazy when I think back of how, what might have been, you know, what might have been. Yeah. Bill, I, I just want to ask one more question because it's, it's involved with this line sure. of, of what we're talking about. Were you one of those boys, Don, that really kind of had a lot of confidence in yourself? Because I feel like you really have to, or did you, did you ever doubt when you went in on an audition? Did you ever psych yourself out? I mean, what was the norm for you? Yeah, that, yeah, that, that you know, you're asking a great question because be, being an actor yourself, you understand that dilemma of, of auditions and, you know, sort of that whole, that whole concept of confidence, uh, how big a part it plays. Um, yeah, I think you're right. I, for some reason, I, I had a lot of confidence. Um, maybe some of it was, was, was well placed and some of it was, you know, um, dreaming, I, you know, and, and like crazy optimism that wasn't merited. I don't know. Um, I'm not sure, but um, you know, you have, that's part of that thing of, I was talking about of being so laser focused and you have to have that, you have to believe in yourself because you know, there's so much rejection and so many times that you won't get the part. And, and a lot back then I, for some reason I understood that it wasn't necessarily a matter of whether you were good enough or the talent was there. For some reason I knew that, you know, casting involves so many other things with the type, the, you know, the, per, the, the physical characteristics, matching people. There's so many variables that come into play. Somehow I instinctively knew that. When I got older, you know, like now, if I, you know, if I go in an audition and don't get it, then, you know, I, I don't have the same sort of healthy attitude that I did back <laughs> then. I don't have that as much, you know, that's why I hate auditions. So, um, you know, I had a lot more confidence back then probably than I do now, although that's starting to change again. I, I think you go through ups and downs in that. But yes, yeah, yeah, that confidence is so important. Uh, the belief in yourself, is, is, it's got to be there. Otherwise, you're in big trouble. Well, and I think that that confidence and the, and the ability and the talent that you have and, and making that decision to go and take that part with Happy Days, I think ended up being a pretty good decision. Yeah. It's funny because, um, you know, when I was after seven, I left the show after my seventh season. And because I was getting, you know, really so, so associated with that, the show, it's a double side, you know, it's a double edged sword that, you know, get all that success. But then at the same time, you're getting so associated with the role that you get, you know, pigeonhole, typecast, whatever you want to call it. And, and the bigger the success, the more you're prone to that to some degree, especially back then when, and, as, and in a sitcom, because back then people did not, there wasn't this back and forth between the mediums of television and film. It wasn't like that. You know, it was either TV, film, they were two separate, like classes, you know, in the two classes. And um, it was hard to go from TV into film, especially from sitcoms. So. Um, I, I decided to, to when my contract was up, not go back. Um, and, and then it was like, you know, I wanted to try to separate myself from the show. So, 
So there were times, and it was because very difficult then. So there were times when I was going, you know, as great as the show was for me, when you're 27 years old and you want a career to last for a long time. And then this is, I couldn't even get in to audition for the roles that I wanted to. They wouldn't even let me audition. So then you start wondering, well, was that the right choice? You know, was that the right choice? And maybe the other thing would have been more in line with what I wanted to do. But, you know, now with the, with all these years and, and, of hind- and now hindsight, of course, it was a, the right decision. I had, you know, put me through some, some, you know, challenging times of trying to get away from that and all that. But, um, you know, maybe that was a necessary thing to go through. I knew it was a great experience. I loved doing it. And now um, I appreciate it more than ever and embrace th- that whole t- time of my life because there's this, all these other things going on now to balance it. Well, you also had the uh, good fortune to meet a cute little Bobby Soxer, uh, who <laughs> well, yeah, that's, partner. Yeah, well, that, th- that, absolutely. I mean, that, if I hadn't done the show, I might not have met Morgan, who we met during Happy Days. She guest starred on the show, and then we started dating, and two years later got married, and we've been married now still 38 years. So wow. um, thank God for Happy Days. <laughs> Right. Yeah, ab- absolutely. Di- and you know, there's, uh, you, you've got some other pretty long standing relationships too, you know, from that show I mentioned earlier about Harvest Time with you and Anson. And, and I understand there's still some pretty close relationships with some of the folks that, you know, you were with on that show. Like what, what's kept those relationships that close or that much in touch for so long? Yeah, I, it was just, we were just so tight you know we really with it sounds cliche oh you know we were like a family you hear that but it was it was like that it was a great great um coming together of these different personalities and and talents and um we we were very uh not only working together but off the set we did a lot of things together as a family we even played we had a soft happy day softball team and would play in major league parks before the regular games as part of a charity and, you know, travel around all over together. And so we were really, really tight. And those relationships have, have you know, have endured. Um, Anson and I are a great, great best friends. You know, we talk several times a week and see each other all the time. Um, and and I, we, uh, all of us stay in touch. We don't see each other as much because if, you know, Ron, Ron's a busy guy and, and he lives on the East Coast. Um, everyone's busy doing things, but we still, it's like, you know, seeing your family when we get together. It's still like that. Do you think that you will work with them, uh, like with Henry or Ron or anyone, uh, you know, in some other capacity again? Yeah, I hope so. Um, it would be great. I, I hope that happens. Uh, Ron cast me in one, in one of his films, uh, Ed TV. This was back in the late 90s, and that was a treat to work with him on one of his films. Um, um, I haven't worked with Henry since, and, you know, who knows, maybe the right project. Um, and it would be great to do something with Ron again, obviously. It would be wonderful. Um, Marion, I directed Marion in my first, the first movie I directed, a film called The Last Best Sunday. And there was a great role, um, this, this what you know, a supporting role, but a very memorable role and uh so marion loved the script and said she would do it and that was that was a major joy to to be able to direct marion um so hopefully yeah i hope to work with with uh with with the guys and get and marion wherever it might turn up who knows well all of you were just so very talented and such a, a joy to watch i i remember you know, everyone looking so forward to Tuesday nights. Yeah. Yeah. Happy day. Tuesday nights at eight o'clock. Yeah. Right. Prime time. <laughs> yeah. It was, yeah, it was pretty, it was crazy time, you know, when it all started happening. And, you know, the first year we were, well, we were like a sort of semi hit. Second year, the ratings went down and we were in danger of not being picked up. And then when we switched to a, uh, format shooting in front of an audience in the third season 
with the three cameras and then Henry's character of the Fonz being elevated to a, sort of more of a starring role. That's when everything took off and we shot up to number one that later in that year and stayed there, you know, for a, a while. And, and it, then, you know, it was a big kind of a whirlwind. Everything was happening in a, like Twilight Zone, I would say. It felt like you're in the Twilight Zone, you know. Well, and I, I think, you know, Don, I think it's great that uh, you you had that success with Happy Days. You've done all the other things that you've done musically, you know, in front of the camera, behind the camera, all these different sort of iterations of you. And you've brought so much joy and so much entertainment to so many people for so long. And we want to not just thank you for joining us tonight on the show, we want to thank you for all of that that you have brought to all of us. And one last thing I want to say, I think there's no doubt about it. You still got it. <laughs> oh, <laughs> thanks, Bill. Thanks. Uh, yeah, even on the Rosie and Bill show, I still got it. <laughs> you got it, baby. So, Don, would you like to uh, close the show out with a song for us? Well, oh, boy, put me on the spot here. Well, um, as you could, I don't know if you could tell, but I'm, I'm in a hotel room. I um, happen to be in Las Vegas. Um, so I don't know if I want to sing right here. But you know what? I'll, as soon as I get home, I'll, I'll go in my, on my computer, in my, in my uh, office, at my desk, and I'll, and I'll do something. And I'll send it to you, okay? That's perfect that because we take okay. the show ahead. So you just send it and, and everyone will get to enjoy it when we air the okay. show. So okay, that's great. Fantastic. All right, well, folks, great. thank you for tuning in, Don. This was so much fun, and oh. we really appreciate taking your time to spend with us and sharing your life and, and your successes and everything. It's been fantastic. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Rosie and Bill, for having me. I really enjoyed our, our conversation, and uh, maybe we'll do it again uh, when I have some other stuff cooking. Okay. That sounds great. Hey, we All look right. forward to that, Don. Thanks again so much. And everyone, Thank we'll see you all next week. Never treats me sweet and gentle the way she should. I've got it bad and that ain't Her heart is sentimental, not made of wood. I've got it bad, and that ain't good. And when the weekend's over, and Monday rolls around, I end up like I start out Just crying my heart out Doesn't love me like I love her Nobody could I've got it bad and that ain't good Like a lonely Willow who is lost in the wood. I've got it bad and that ain't good. And the things I tell my pillow, no, nobody should. I got it bad, I got it bad and that ain't Though folks with good intentions They tell me to save up my tears I'm glad I'm mad about her I can't live without her Lord above Make her love me the way that she should I Got it bad, and that ain't good. I've got
got it bad and that ain't good I've got it bad and that ain't good